Hello, I'm Ileana Pena, I'm professor of medicine at Wayne State and at Central Michigan University, and I'm also a heart failure transplant cardiologist, and this is my blog. We often have uh, interesting guests to talk to us about topics that really have a wide and general interest. I'm really happy today to have my good friend, Peter McCullough, who is professor of medicine at Texas A&M School of Medicine, to talk a little bit about other guidelines, not the guidelines that I usually talk to you about, the American Heart, American College of Cardiology, but these are the KDECO guidelines, which I didn't know existed until a few years ago, thank you, thanks to Dr. McCullough. So Dr. McCullough is a rare species who has really combined in his research interests, not only the heart failure heart, but also the kidney. Uh, and so when I have these questions, Peter is the person that I go to. So Peter, welcome uh, to our blog and, and thank you for your time. Tell the audience what KDGO is. Well, and yeah, Ileana, thanks for having me. Uh, KDGO stands for Kidney Disease International Global Outcomes. And it, KDGO is a not-for-profit entity that was spawned by the National Kidney Foundation uh, and centered in Europe. Offshore, uh, in a sense, outside the United States, and they are charged with uh, holding controversies conferences, which are largely to um, identify gaps in knowledge and then put together guidelines bodies uh, that, that really span the entire scope of acute and chronic kidney disease. And um, I've, obviously, we were together at a KDGO conference uh, in Greece several years ago with the controversy of heart failure and kidney disease, something that cardiologists battle with. You know, I got to call the nephrologist because creatinine went up. Um, and we had a publication come out of that that I thought was, was really very reasonable. But what are the more important guidelines that you could refer our primary care audience and our general cardiology audience to look at? I think the most highly cited guideline is the 2012 KDGO acute kidney injury guideline. This was the first uh, guideline that set the terminology at acute kidney injury. It used to be called acute renal failure or acute renal insufficiency. That's what it was called when I was in fellowship. Yeah. It was, it's now AKI as of 2012. It set the stages of AKI, stage one, two, and three. Stage one, a rise in creatinine greater than 0 0.3 milligrams per deciliter. Stage two is a doubling of serum creatinine. Stage three is a tripling of creatinine or going on dialysis. So it set the stages of acute kidney injury and gave us a framework for research. I personally think the acute kidney injury guideline was a little premature for clinical practice. Uh, and, you, and when you're around in the hospital now, all the, the residents want to tell us that everybody has an AKI. So. Yeah, but they also use the CKD very freely without applying the definitions. So recently, I have seen the hypertension guidelines. Now, what drove a hypertension guideline? I, I'm always fascinated by the fact that We've been talking about hypertension. I mean, since I was a fellow, we were talking about hypertension. And it wasn't big on the radar of general cardiologists. We relegated it to the nephrologists. And yet we know, and I want to remind my audience from the SPRINT trial, that if you really reduce that blood pressure as low as 120, you will reduce heart failure incidence by like 50%, something we've been saying for years. Now we have the data that actually show this and how it works in the older patients as well as in the younger patients. So why now hypertension guidelines? Well, let me just say, I, I completely agree that the blood pressure sensitive outcomes uh, in our field are stroke and heart failure. A lot of people don't know this. They think it's coronary heart disease and it's really not. The controversy in kidney disease is that as kidney disease worsens, uh, the kidney disease itself raises blood pressure. So that really was a controversy of whether or not blood pressure control conversely can help the natural history of kidney disease. And this guideline updated over 200 studies uh, and found that in patients who uh, have a reduced estimated GFR less than 60 and begin to have albumin in the urine and albumin and creatinine ratio greater than 30 milligrams per gram, that in fact, these patients do benefit from a lower blood pressure as we knew from the SPRINT trial for heart failure and stroke. 
And so um, there, now they update, instead of a target blood pressure of 130 over 85, the target blood pressure is, is 120 over 70. Uh, KDGO has already always had a big push for ambulatory blood pressure monitoring uh, for better diagnosis and management of, uh, of hypertension, uh, particularly in those with uh, kidney disease. Uh, so there are some targets there. But the big news for cardiologists is we really need to measure the albumin to creatinine ratio. And if we need any further evidence that we need to go lower with blood pressure, um, uh, boy, that, that measure, which many cardiologists don't measure, uh, really can help us. Yeah, it should be part of the standard routine when you're bringing the patient in and you're doing everything else. You're getting their NT pro BMP, for example. And it's so easy. It's such an easy test to do, but it's so telling. So in this guideline, are there recommendations for specific drugs? Well, the, the RAS inhibitors have always been uh, the featured drugs. And uh, they are recommended uh, for type 1 diabetes with kidney disease. It's the ACE inhibitors. And type 2 diabetes and kidney disease is the ARBs because of the clinical trials. The guidelines have not... Uh, yet taken on uh, SGLT2 inhibitors or the combination of valsartan and sacubutrol. Those are really more cardiovascular, cardiorenal applications. Yeah, and yet, um, whenever the creatinine bumps up, um, the cardiologists remove the RAS inhibition uh, from this fear of, oh, I'm, I'm killing the kidney. And uh, I think in that conference, we very nicely showed where the data are, and the data are just not there. On the contrary, it's protective. Well, this is probably the single greatest teaching we could ever impart to our colleagues is this stopping the ACE inhibitor, ARB, or the neprilysin inhibitor, or holding it uh, because of an azotemia, a rise in BOA and creatinine, is the biggest mistake any uh, inpatient doctor can make or even outpatient doctor make. We That's should right. manage patients through the azotemia. There's over 20 published studies that show when we do this, we hurt the patient. We set the patient backwards, and yet that's the very first thing we see in a nephrology consultation or a cardiology consultation. We need to be able to uh, manage patients through azotemia, provided blood pressure is okay, and pr provided potassium is manageable, uh, we cannot get faked out with uh, uh, changes in BO and creatinine. Let me say one more thing. I started out with the KDGO guideline. In heart failure, when the BO and creatinine go up, in the absence of sepsis and at the absence of shock, it's not acute kidney injury. It's what we call worsened renal function, which is a transient hemodynamic change that's reflected in the BUN and creatinine. Right, and in the uh, DOSE trial of Mike Felker, it actually showed that that creatinine bump had no association with increased bad outcomes, mortality, hospitalization, and yet it's being done. It's what our residents learn and they do it the minute the, the patient gets into the hospital. One, one more question, you know, when you go back to Sprint, it was very interesting to me that in Sprint, they gave a list of medications, but they made no recommendations about what drugs to use. It was left up to the investigator. And so I think the point is that we have so many different drugs that work that can lower blood pressure effectively, many of them generic, which are incredibly cheap. I know something like enalapril is like four dollars for two weeks um, at you know a place like Walmart or a place like a big grocery store. But but there, there's no sense. You know the drugs are just ordered without a sense of a plan. And I still think that we need to recommend to our listeners here and our audience: you have to have a plan of what you're going to do. You start off with a drug, you may want to up titrate that one a bit before you start the other one, but don't give up and don't tell me that a blood pressure of 140 in every visit is okay, because it's not okay. Just a couple of points. Uh, you know, the RAS inhibitors are featured for patients with coronary heart disease. Uh, beta blockers clearly have a, a role. Um, remember that uh, the genesis of hypertension uh, is sodium retention. And so about 80% of African-Americans, probably 40% of Caucasians are salt sensitive. So the use of a diuretic, not really to cause diuresis, but to actually cause some sodium excretion makes the body much more responsive to the blood pressure drugs that we have in the program. Uh, it's common for patients to need two or three drugs uh, provided one of them is a diuretic. 
And uh, I think for me, part of my teaching of my residents is always that if you have an African-American patient with this severe blood pressure, until you put them on that thiazide drug, you're just not gonna get that blood pressure down all the way. And, and, and that it really, really works. Now I wanna switch over to another point that you made a very good point about ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Uh, I was on the very first uh, KDOKI or Kidney Disease uh, Outcomes Quality Initiative Hypertension Guidelines, I think over 20 years ago. And I was so impressed with the Europeans who already had in their uh, guidelines that one needed ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in order to establish the diagnosis of hypertension. It clears up this whole issue of white coat hypertension and all the confusion with patients trying to get their logs. So I'm strongly in favor of it. What the listener needs to know is when we use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, we have a standards for daytime blood pressure, which is a bit higher. We want to see a nocturnal dip in blood pressure. And overall, we want to see five to 10 points lower on the mean as we would in a seated blood pressure in the office. You know, as, as we move on with this, uh, with this chapter, I really want to emphasize the fact that blood pressure doesn't necessarily belong to the nephrologist, that it belongs to every specialty, including primary care. And primary care has the privilege of seeing patients very early, often before we see them. And that blood pressure targeting, even in the young when I'm asked, what, what do I need to do to keep my health? Know your numbers, know what your blood pressure is, have somebody take it. Uh, you know, right now with the pandemic, a lot of these blood pressure machines in say CVS or Walgreens have been covered up because everybody's afraid of the pandemic. But that's a very useful, you're shopping, you're in CVS, you stick your hand in there, you get a blood pressure. At least it gives you a sense of what range, but we can't just relegate this and say, oh, it's a nephrologist issue. No, every single one of us has, has to pay attention. We would lower cardiovascular disease so significantly if we could only do that. We could probably eliminate stroke even because most of the stroke uh, parameters happen to be hypertensive. But anyway, Peter, any parting messages that you'd like to give our audience? Well, you know, I think the future is bright. Uh, the single greatest challenge I have with a young person is the recognition that a chronic medication would become part of one's life. And, and when we look at registries of seniors, people over age 80, only 10% of people can make it to over age 80 requiring no medicines. 90% of us need some medicinal aid. It's very common that uh, blood pressure lowering is one of those medicinal aids. And it's a matter of finding something where um, there can be a basically a lifelong relationship between the patient and a medication to keep that blood pressure in a healthy range. And getting your medical history of your family is equally important because there's a lot of genetic transmission. Peter, I wanna thank you for coming with me today. That was great information. And to you, I hope that this information is good for you in your office and your practice. This is Ileana Pina signing off. I hope to see you soon again.